Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the Westbury Public Library, Westbury, New York. It is the 9th of August, 2006, approximately 2.30 p.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? William Edward Goldsboro, Sr. Um, date of birth, January 10th, 1926. Um, place. And the place was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Uh, I had completed high school, had entered college under what was called a work-study program at Hampton Institute. And uh, I was, uh, I had spent two years there uh, in the trade school. At that time, Hampton uh, had a trade school which had been uh, established to assist, um, uh, uh, let's say, families, men, young men, young women, uh, uh, to, uh, as it were, be trained for uh, a way of life, so to speak, a better way of life, uh, as they moved from slavery into uh, the mainstream society. And, uh, uh, there were many trades. I happened to have de decided to take auto mechanics. Uh, I took auto mechanics because uh, the most respected male in uh, my community was uh, an auto mechanic. Yes, um, um, people like, uh, let's say, people that are well respected in the community are uh, 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 examples that many, many of us use and we will we'll, we'll attempt to emulate. But at any rate, that's what I took. When I returned, however, from the service, at, after I completed my service and went back to school, I decided to major in architectural engineering. So uh, I, that's what I did, and mm -hmm. uh, I completed it uh, and uh, graduated in 1949. Okay. Um, do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Uh, I was, yes, I was at home, and I think we heard it on the radio, I think, um, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I was at home in Maryland, yes, because this was in, of course, 1941 and um, December 7th, mm -hmm. and um, that's, that's basically how Do you remember was. any reaction to it, your reaction at the time? My reaction? Um, I don't really recall my exact reaction, but uh, I did follow it uh, quite a bit later. Uh, the following year, I was a um, um, senior and in high school, and we took a trip to Washington, D.C. And uh, during the time we were there, um, or on the way back, someone had a radio, and the radio reported about uh, uh, we head down the, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the German, major German battleships. I'm not sure if it was the Bis Bismarck or something like that, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it, it was, there was a very keen interest on the part of uh, everyone with regard to the war and uh, how eventually, of course, the uh, European theater would be, have to be uh, a ground upon which mm -hmm. we would uh, launch, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Did you uh, enlist or were you drafted? Well, I was drafted. Okay. Uh, there was an old saying. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know whether uh, whether this is uh, something that I should say or not, but uh, during those days, every living with a swinging went. And uh, you went unless there were, uh, you passed or failed to pass two doctors, one would uh, one would be in front of you and would tell you to open your mouth. The other one would tell you to spread your <laughs> and spread your legs and look. And if he didn't, they didn't see one another. You were in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so most of us most of us were drafted. Okay, so, uh, you were drafted into the army uh, in July of '44. I was drafted to the armies, but there's an interesting story there. Okay. Uh, my original draft board was in Chestertown, Maryland, Eastern Shore, where, you know, where mm -hmm. I grew up. And uh, they had called me 
in the middle of the year, school year. They didn't care about whether you finished this term or not. They, they would fill in their quotas. Each draft board had a quota that they had to satisfy mm -hmm. in a given month or whatever. I was called. Now, the ploy of many of us who were in school down there, the draft board had a situation where if you transferred your, your uh, uh, draft board eligibility or whatever uh, down here, you, we'll let you serve out the semester and uh, then you'll go after at the end of the semester. You definitely will be going. Well, that's what I did. Okay? Uh, in 1943, 44, somewhere in that time, I had gotten this from my local draft board in Chestertown. And I transferred it down to Hampton, Virginia. And um, they, uh, in, in June or so of 1944, uh, I got my orders to come. But I went up to Richmond to have my uh, exam, you know, your physical. Okay, I, for some reason or other, they didn't call me within a six-week period. After six weeks, you have to take another physical. Now, when I went the first time, uh, they asked me what type of way I wanted to go, and I told them the Army. Well, where, they, where did they put me? In the Navy. I go back, they called me back after the six weeks had expired, another physical. I had that physical. And they asked me where I wanted to go. Uh, they, I said, Navy. I ended up in the Army. And I was happy because that's where I really wanted to go in the first place, okay? I didn't want to uh, be on board a ship, uh, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I ended up in the Army. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where did you go for basic training? <clears throat> I went to basic training out in Fort Lewis, Washington, all right on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. It's a four day trip um, and whatnot. Uh, you know, on the train uh, to Fort Lewis, Washington. Now you, uh, of course, had been away from home then, if being in Virginia and going to college, so this wasn't your first time away from home. No, How did you keep contact with those at home? Did you do write a lot of letters? And yeah, write a lot of letter writing, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, how long were you at uh, Fort Lewis? I was at Fort Lewis for 16 months. Mm -hmm. uh, we were out there, we finished our training. Uh, the um, war in the um, European theater uh, was of course well underway and uh, it basically ended while we were, uh, uh, as we were completing our, well we had completed our basic training and we were actually in an advanced training stage. But then, some of you know that the, art, the outfit that I was in, uh, they didn't have a, a place to, for, for us to uh, maybe call. I don't know why, but what the reason was. At any rate, they were sending troops back from the European theater. They moved us out of the barracks at Fort Lewis, sent us out to Yakima, Washington, and we, uh, that was, there was a firing range out there, and we were to go out there live uh, in, in, a, in a bivouac set setup whereby we lived in what's called pyramidal tents. You ever hear those pyramidal tents? Yeah. Um, the, 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 they are a step above the uh, regular t tent that you put down. Mm -hmm. Pup tent? Me. Pup tent, yeah. Uh, and uh, they sleep about uh, eight, six to eight um, people, if you know what I mean. And they have a foundation mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, we lived there for I've forgotten how many months, uh, and uh, we would go out into the onto, into the range, and, and we would spread out into formation, and go through uh, the range area where there used to be a firing range, and we would scout for on well, well the, we, we were looking for anything that looked like a piece of shrapnel. You weren't supposed to touch it; just leave it there and mark it, and that's what we did. And then eventually, in the latter part of uh, 1945, uh, my unit was alerted uh, that it was going to be moving out. Uh, I don't know where they were going. Funny thing is, the very day that we were scheduled to be getting set up to move out, I came down with a uh, swollen glands. 
and I, I went to sick hall, and um, the doctor examined me, and uh, he ordered me to go to Madigan General Hospital. So I was in the hospital. While I was in the hospital, my unit shipped out. So when I came back uh, uh, from the hospital, uh, my unit uh, was gone. So I was sent to Fort Lawton, Washington, which was like the replacement uh, depot mm -hmm. for transferring troops out for overseas duty. Mm -hmm. And so in other words, I became like uh, an odd man out, so to speak. So I uh, went to Fort Lewis, uh, Fort Lawton, Washington, and uh, joined with a number of other so-called stragglers or whatever you want to call them. And um, eventually I shipped out in November of 1945 on the USS General S.D. Sturgis. And uh, we took an 18-day trip that normally takes 11 days because there were typhoons out there. Mm -hmm. The most, the most harrowing. I, I, to this day, I don't know how we we survived. Uh, the ship, you couldn't go topside. If you went topside, the waves were so deep, so big that you would end up uh, being thrown overboard mm -hmm. or washed overboard, uh, and so on. Five thousand troops were on that uh, USS General S. D. Sturgis. Okay, and uh, so. But it was in Fort Lawton where I had the most, I guess you would say, okay. the, the experience that when I share it, and I don't walk around sharing it a lot because it's painful, the, the, the most, uh, I would say, uh, harrowing type of an experience whereby, uh, of course, you know, at that time, the Army was segregated yes. by law. Yes. And, um, we, uh, colored troops, as we, you know, we were put over into an area in the dining hall, mess hall, uh, we were put into an area away from uh, the other troops. But the POWs, German prisoners of war, had POW on their back, they were allowed to, as it were, cohabit with the uh, other troops, you know, the white troops and so on. Um, that experience uh, is one that some of us probably, everyone didn't experience that because everyone didn't pass through where they saw the mm -hmm. POWs, mm -hmm. but it so, so happened that I did, okay, and I saw that. Uh, there was another odd situation during the service that uh, was second only to this, and that was that um, since I had had college training and I was rather fluent in and uh, what not in uh, English and, and, and in speaking. Uh, my company commander used me on Saturday morning. You would, on Saturday morning you would have your normal uh, inspection, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, full, as they call it, full field inspection in, in the barracks and uh, what not. And then later you might go out to the parade ground and what not then for an inspection. But, Following the inspections and the parade ground, they would have orientation. And guess what the highlight of the orientation was during the World War II? You're fighting for the four freedoms. You are fighting for the four freedoms. I had to teach that, okay? And, and I, I was obligated to do it, and, uh, I, and I did, okay? That we we're fighting for the four freedoms. But that was the irony of my situation uh, insofar as that was concerned because uh, technically speaking, I and my fellow uh, troops uh, didn't feel as though we were, you know, we were equal and, and free. But that, I'm just sharing that with you because it is a fact and so on. Um, I'm going to give you a positive from the situation that uh, in, uh, in, in going into the Army. Uh, it took me away from my pursuit of my education and whatnot. But when it returned me, when I was returned back to civilian life, I was able to, as it were, use the GI Bill mm -hmm. 
and complete my education without having to worry about uh, where the money was coming from. Because before I was working work study, whereby I would work uh, X numbers of hours in a given day and study a certain number of hours in a given day. Plus I had a newspaper route where I sold 130 newspapers, uh, okay? Uh, in the local community, uh, which was near the, that's Hampton uh, was the major town, but Phoebus was, was nearby. And I used to sell newspapers to about 130 customers uh, on the morning. I'd get up at 5 o'clock, go out, throw them, fold the newspapers, I'd get, I'd get them, fold them, throw them, you know, and uh, be, be, be back by 6.30, go to breakfast, and then go to class at, say, 7, starting at 7 o'clock, okay? But uh, the positive I'm saying is that I think that many GIs, black GIs, um, benefited. Many didn't, but many did. And uh, as a result, I'm going to say that that was a positive that I, I see from the war that I haven't seen anyone write about it, but I think someone should write about it, that the war had some positive uh, effect upon us as a, a race, if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. from the standpoint that it helped us to uh, uh, fund an education that we otherwise, uh, prior to the war, were having some difficulty in doing. Yeah, the um, self-sustainment, going out and working and studying, uh, helped to make you a man. But uh, if you can do it, you know, do something like the GI Bill, I'd say, oh, uh, it's great. So I see that as a positive. Mm -hmm. The other thing, uh, that interesting thing that I'm going to share with you, I got to the replacement depot after we arrived in Japan in December. We arrived in December, uh, in December of 1945. We arrived in Japan or off of the ship. We went to Azama, Honshu, Japan, which is near Tokyo. I mean, yeah, near Tokyo, or New York Army, I'm sorry. Uh, Zama was a replacement depot. Now, there were various units located throughout, uh, you know, let, let's say Honshu, the island of Honshu, under MacArthur, and they had uh, people that were cycling out because they were becoming eligible to cycle out, you know. Mm -hmm. Once you get X number of points, if you got a certain number of points, you were eligible to request and they would normally send you home unless you were in a certain uh, job that if they really wanted to, uh, they, could, they could tell you that, well, we can't let you go because we, we don't have a replacement for you. By the way, my company commander told me that when I was ready to leave. And uh, I uh, turned to him and I said, sir, I said, I've been a good soldier. And I said, I, and I, I earned a, this good conduct medal for it. I said, but if I can't go when I'm eligible to go, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not going to be as good a soldier as you want me to be. I told him that, too. Mm -hmm. I was on the next ship out. <laughs> 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 but my MOS that, that they trained me for, in spite of my civilian training, was as a rigger. A rigger, 089. I get over to Zama the replacement depot, they look at my civilian and my army MOS, and guess what? They sent me to the motor pool uh, in a general service, an engineering general service region. And I eventually, shortly after I got there, I became the motor sergeant. Okay? Uh, the army had, had, or I don't know whether they still have the rule, but there's the army way, and of course there's a, the other way or whatever, but the, 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 they wanted to train you the army way, so to speak, and as a result, uh, uh, if, if you were came in with, let's say, an auto mechanic, they wanted you to come in and they wanted to train you to be, you know, uh, the mechanic or technician uh, using their techniques and their mm -hmm. rules and whatnot. Uh, lo and behold, I got in, in my motor pool eventually. Uh, I I did work above. The second echelon, you're not supposed to go above, you're supposed to, ordinance is supposed to get 
a work above a certain echelon, you're supposed to send the vehicle to ordinance and have them repair it there. I did work at my, in, in my uh, company that was above the normal, you know, because I couldn't wait for, for, the, for the trucks. The trucks would go out and, and, uh, and uh, diamond tea trucks and they would uh, uh, have them loaded down with gravel and rocks and they would hit these big holes and know that they'd break the springs and things like that. Well, you know what I did? I got them into the uh, motor, and normally while they were the, the truck was redlined, you would they they would be they could sit back and do nothing. Well, I I took I had a big wrench, and I had the truck, uh, and I had them break these these uh, shackles. You know the mm -hmm. these big springs have these big shackles and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Oh, that 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 stopped it. Okay. And I had the support of my company commander to, uh, to, to, to do that. I had uh, a number of, um, you know, oh, excellent uh, experiences and, uh, uh, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us about some of them that you, you recall? That I recall? Yes. Oh, um, well, uh, in general, uh, I would say that I, out, out, in, out in Tacoma, Seattle, Washington area, it's an interesting place. Tacoma, uh, I, I didn't stop there whenever I was on uh, leave, or weekend or whatnot. I would go over to Seattle and I would do things that most of the fellows uh, considered sissy or something like that. Uh, I saw Madame Butterfly at, at the, uh, over, over in, in Seattle, uh, uh, you know. And so on. Uh, I went to see um, the football game. You know, I've forgotten who they played. Uh, you know, I, I went to see football game and things like that. A number of fellows would go up to coma, get drunk. MPs would end up bringing them back to the bar. I'd get back at maybe 11, 12 o'clock uh, on Saturday night and look up. And there's CBs or the MPs bringing back one guy in particular. Uh, uh, every Saturday night, and he'd become back. You know, he went up there and got uh, loaded, and you know, became disorderly. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, 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 they did what uh, you know they're supposed to do. You know, and it was a, as the saying goes, picked him up and brought him back to his outfit. You know, and uh, so on. And in some instances, you know, he he get whacked over the head. You know, if you if you're disorderly. Uh, you know, they can't control you. Um, in general, um, I would say that uh, um, I found the the, uh, the Japanese people as a people to be uh, okay. Average person would say you can't trust them, but you you uh, we we could okay. Only when I went on. Uh, we went on a um, uh, R and R rest, you know, relaxation. Mm -hmm. We sent they sent us up to Kyoto, and this was several months before I was uh, eligible to come home. And I went up to Kyoto, and uh, of course others, others went uh, uh, along, you know, quite a, quite a distance to go from, uh, you know, where we were up to Kyoto, but we went up there. Now, Kyoto was a city that was basically untouched, okay? And uh, there was CID there and uh, other, other uh, military um, security people. And one of the rules that we were told to, to follow was, don't ever go out alone. Always go with a buddy. Use the buddy system, okay? That was the one rule that they used. But uh, down in Honshu, where we were, uh, I was at uh, an area near Kashikawa Army Air Base, and um, we um, fraternized, as it were, with the, the, the local people and uh, got along quite well. And as I say, so much so as we had uh, a couple of kids that we uh, used to uh, look after. Tell us about them. Um, actually, it's been, that was in 1945, that's 61 years ago. 
long time. But basically, they were sweet kids. I mean, I mean, just as sweet as you would ever want uh, kids to be. And kids are kids. <clears throat> I've learned in my life that kids are kids. Um, I go out now and I go to the supermarket and I, and uh, for some reason or other, kids see me and you know they they look at me and smile and whatnot. I had one last week that uh, really brought uh, uh, almost brought tears to my eyes. This little. This little baby, mind you, that isn't probably more than six or seven months old, looks up, sees me, and is laughing and smiling as if it was, I was the greatest thing she had ever seen, you know. <laughs> and I said, hi, honey, and whatnot, and she was, uh, you know, very responsive and that sort of thing. But at any rate, uh, the Jap these, these kids over there, I found them to be, as I would say, except that they were older, they were, they were not toddlers. These kids were, uh, let's say, eight, seven, eight, maybe nine, ten years old. They weren't much older than that, okay? But um, we, we, um, we didn't, as it were, do much more than, as it were, share uh, many of the uh, kinds of things that kids like, you know, uh, candy, peanuts, and things like that, you know. Now, were they orphans? No, no, they weren't orphans. Okay. No, no, they weren't orphans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they were... Kids that were, from, you know, from the local mm -hmm. okay. area. Mm -hmm. Now, what impressed you about Japan at the time you were there? Was any things stand out over yes. than others? Yes. Um, uh, prior to Truman dropping the bomb, I'm going to say Truman because we dropped the bomb, uh, we were getting ready at the time for a Pacific invasion. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard the term ASCOM C? ASCOM C. A S C O M hyphen C. That kept coming up uh, as the uh, program that was going to be basically. Uh, the invasion of uh, in the Pacific invasion. What I found, what we found, is when we got to Japan and when we looked at, uh, we went up to the, the Japanese West Point, for example. Their uh, you know training major training area. Mm -hmm. They had everything on the ground. You know, like right now, uh, the Israelis are finding that the Hezbollah mm -hmm. is tough to. Uh, I'm sure Hezbollah probably has something similar. The, uh, they, they were putting all these rockets up, and even though Israel is dropping bombs and raiding, they, they probably have everything underground and uh, whatnot. Who knows? I don't know what it is, but the point is, had we gone there, it would have been uh, bloody, bloody, bloody. It would have been bloody to, to uh, try to uh, uh, get them out, okay? Uh, I saw their zero, Japanese zero. You've heard of the Japanese mm -hmm. zero. Uh, it was basically a, a suicide plane almost because it didn't have the kind of armor that we have on our, our jets or on our planes because at that time they didn't have jets, okay? It was propeller driven. But, uh, the, and of course, the Japanese zero could maneuver better without all that armor anyway, uh, if you know what I mean. But, um, that was one of the things that I found. Um, um, the other thing, of course, was driving on the left side of the road. You drive on the left side of the road in Japan. Mm -hmm. did, you, uh, did you know that? I, I didn't know that. I knew Europe. I didn't know that. Yeah, you drive on the left side of the road in Japan. Um, something that I'm sure other people will, will lie, tell me I'm lying when I say it. But I learned to drive every vehicle in the Army without any instruction. In fact, I learned to drive without anyone teaching me. Now, I will admit this, that as a youngster growing up, my brother-in-law, I would sit in the car alongside of him, and he would let me steer the car, and so on. But, if you know anything about the vehicles in the Army at the time, especially the 6x6, which was a basic uh, truck, you had a double clutch. You ever hear of double clutching? Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and it was a technique that 
Today, uh, average person wouldn't know how to do it, would not be able to do it. But I was a double clutch maniac. Uh, <laughs> everything from, you know, the uh, 6 by 6 the Diamond T, uh, you name it, I, I, I drove it, okay? And, I, and nobody taught me. I, I, I taught myself, you know, and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, basically, um, as I look back, uh, you know, it was quite an experience. Mm -hmm. Now, how long were you in Japan? Well, I was only there for n nine months, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was only there until I got my points. And when I got my points, I, I, I shipped out and came on back home. In other words, I was there from about December until July. Well, that's not even nine months, is it? Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <coughs> when you came back to the States, you were discharged? I was came back and I was sent to Fort Meade uh, and I was discharged from Fort mm -hmm. Meade, Maryland, yes. Now you said you went back into the reserves. When did you go into the reserves? Or uh, the exact date of when I went into the reserves, I do not recall. Mm -hmm. But I did go back into the reserves, uh, and uh, I um, there was an outfit um, down at Forty Second Street in Manhattan. Um, uh, what was the name of it now? <laughs> I've forgotten the name of it. But at any rate, uh, the fort. You mean? Huh? The fort down there? There's no, there's no fort. It, it, it was a um, training, training facility on 42nd Street where, uh, you know, reservists would go uh, report uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, like an armory, armory basis, huh? ar an armory down there somewhere? Sort of, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How long were you in the reserves? I I have forgotten, but uh, I was discharged in '62. Uh, yeah, I uh, I think I was uh, I I was in the reserves all of the while. I think, but I can't say for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, what did you do when you went in with reserves? In the reserves? Uh, yes. I was uh, in an outfit that was like a supply outfit, and uh, we got into the area of uh, uh, supply logistics. We went out to Granite City, Illinois for our training and um, so on. Uh, at the time, we were, the military was coming up with a special program. In fact, the funny thing is that the reason why I was signed to this outfit, or with supply outfit with the reserve there was, I was working with an outfit in Brooklyn, New York, uh, called NMCO, uh, Navy Mil Material, uh, gee, I've forgotten what the exact term was. Um, anyway, what, was, what they were doing, the military at that time, and this was in the late 50s and going on into the 60s and 70s. They were um, standardizing material for the various armed services, standardizing it in such a way that a blanket, Navy blanket that maybe would uh, be ordered in two or three colors, Air Force blanket in two or three colors, Army blanket in, in several, whatever colors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They were coming with one single spec, one standard, and then that would come up with. They would come up with a number that would then be able. Uh, the various services would be able to order the same item, meeting the the, the, the federal standard. You know that would satisfy all of the different. Uh, uh, services and uh, you save on what? You save on procurement, you save on the storage, uh, and uh, it, it makes all the sense in the world, okay? Mm -hmm. Now I worked on that for three years. Then they were going to send us over to Fort Monmouth 
my outfit was moving from Brooklyn to Fort Monmouth. I didn't want to leave uh, New York, so I left. And uh, I went over to the um, Transit Authority and hired on as a junior engineer and stayed there for 34 years and retired in 1940, I'm sorry, 19, 1989 after 34 years. And, well, I've been retired since then, okay? But um, um, that um, I, I was a sergeant in charge of a, uh, a platoon uh, of, of men, you know, and we would we went up to what camp drum. drum mm -hmm. Yes, we went up there for for during the summer for our summer training and that sort of thing. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we would go up there, but we also went out to um, Granite City, Illinois, which is just this side of St. Louis, Missouri. If you, if you know anything about the, uh, Grand City, Illinois. Grand City, Illinois is, uh, is uh, the most western part of uh, the state, Illinois, if you know what I mean, just before you go into the uh, Grover Bridge, after you leave Grand City, Grover Bridge, and you're in, you're in St. Louis, Missouri, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, whatnot. But uh, we used to drive, a friend of mine and I would drive a thousand, it's a thousand miles from here, from New York City, out to St. Louis, and we would drive. We would leave in the morning, uh, Saturday morning at seven o'clock, and seven o'clock next morning we'd be back here in New York. We drove 24 hours nonstop. Uh, we would just switch off. He would drive X numbers of miles or whatever, and then he'd get in the back and sleep. I would drive and so on. And he had a Rocket 88 uh, Oldsmobile. Running engine, I'm gonna tell you, that was some car. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Now you were still, <clears throat> I know you were in the reserves, but um, you were in the service in the 50s when uh, Truman integrated the army. Did you see? No, I wasn't. You weren't. No, I wasn't. No, I, I, I wasn't. In, you mean I wasn't? You mean you were in the reserves at that I, time? I, I. I wasn't in, I, I I wasn't in the reserves at the time I don't think but I think I went in shortly after. Oh okay. Yeah. Well then you noticed the changes then. Yes. Oh so. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. The changes took place. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The changes did take place while uh, I was in the reserves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, I guess that's. Did you uh, you made use of the GI Bill you said? Oh yes. Did you uh, use it for anything else, like a home or anything? Uh, uh, I didn't use it for a home in, the, in a direct sense. Uh, I used it to, to check that when I bought my first home. I, uh, I, I did use it uh, to try to, uh, to, to uh, more or less have them come up to standard and make sure that the, the uh, contractor was doing, because I, I was the first owner of uh, the, the, the first home that we mm -hmm. bought. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay. We lived for, uh, we had four kids uh, in, in three years. Uh, we had our oldest daughter. Eleven months later, we had twins. My wife had twins. And two years later, we had our youngest son. This was three years, we had four kids. Mm. Any anyway, rate, um, we, at that time, you couldn't get, nobody would rent to, you if you had children in, in New York City. Uh, very few landlords would rent to you with kids. Mm -hmm. You know? I know it may have changed, but... So, we, we lived for a number of years in Queensbridge Houses, which is uh, the largest housing uh, project in, this, in, uh, in, I think, in the country. Queensbridge Houses, I think, is the largest housing um, project in the country, I think. We lived there for a number of years. The housing assistant liked us. Uh, she wanted to move us to uh, a larger apartment. She insisted. And I said, no, when we move, we're going to move into our own home. And that's what we did. Okay? But uh, I, uh, we, my wife and I can say that we've, uh, as it were, uh, paved the way for to for, so that we could live into our own home, and of course, since then we bought two more. We bought one in the Virgin Islands that we thought we could go back to because of my wife came from the Virgin Islands. I, I met and married her there, and um, 
we thought at one point we would go back there. So uh, shortly after we bought the first home, five years later, we uh, started a purchase and we bought uh, the second home. We set in motion to purchase of the second home in the Virgin Islands. Not a large house, but it was large enough for us if we went back, you know. Mm -hmm. It was a two bedroom. Make a long story short, with, with the various hurricanes that came along, it um, caused us one time, uh, Hugo cost us $20,000 worth of damage. Okay, and the insurance covered about two thirds of it, and the rest of it we had to pay. Make a long story short, we decided uh, that we uh, weren't going to go back uh, and stay. So we saw, eventually sold that house, and then we bought a house in Westbury. We kept the two family that the first house we bought in East Elmhurst. We still own that, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, so on. And uh, you know, did you ever join any veterans organizations? Um, I not as an active member. I, I did. I was with the American Legion for mm -hmm. a while uh, uh, when they insisted that I join, but I I, I haven't been uh, an active member now. I, did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? No, because what happened was that the fellows that I was active with, uh, I lost contact yeah, with they, uh, when, when, they left. When, they, when they left. And when, mm -hmm. I, I, I never did know where they went, mm -hmm. uh, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see them in Japan. I saw a number of other people that uh, I had known in civilian life uh, uh, over in Japan while I was there, but I didn't see any of them. None of them did I see. I, I, I became acquainted with a whole different group of fellows uh, over in uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I know you kind of alluded to this. How do you think your time in the service has changed or made, had an effect on your life? You certainly said about giving you the college, the yeah. ability to attend college. It gave me the ability mm -hmm. to uh, attend college and to uh, complete my education. And um, I, uh, I did well uh, in, on my job uh, when I went to the engineering department. I eventually became uh, like the executive uh, assistant to uh, the deputy chief engineer in charge of all the construction. Uh, and uh, I had a specialized job with the, the engineering department whereby uh, you've heard about change orders, I assume, on any job, almost any job you do, you can't complete it generally without what's called a change order. A change order is brought about by omissions and oversights that during design uh, and or construction pop up mm -hmm. that you were that were not expected. There is what's called a contingency fund, generally which is about five to ten percent that is put into every contract to cover such over, um, I'm going to say not overruns, but uh, the, um, uh, these extras, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. And uh, you have to write a change order in order to do that. I was one of the chief uh, change order writers. In other words, I wrote, uh, I finished, I did all the change orders. You familiar with the New York City subway system? Anyway, we put in. You know it's there. <laughs> we put in three new stations um, in 1988 and 89. We completed we completed three new stations in Southeast Queens in 88, and we opened them. And all the change orders that were necessary to complete that, basically, I did all those change mm -hmm. orders, and which amounted to millions and millions of dollars. Then we. Next day, next year, we went over to uh, uh, Queens, Queensbridge Houses, Roosevelt Island, 63rd and Lex. There was a station at each of those locations. And we had to complete uh, those stations so that we could open that line. I did all those change orders. Mm -hmm. Each time I was given an office in a specific location where I worked and uh, whatnot, and um, we completed that, and I shocked everybody when I gave uh, gave them my uh, put in my retirement papers, because everyone thought that I was never going to leave. They thought I was going to die on the job. 
they had they were they were preparing a special offer for me because I was such I had become such a uh, 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 an important cog in the change order, you know. Everyone can't write, uh, you know, change mm -hmm. orders and whatnot. And I was able to do that. And uh, they they were putting up a special offer for me to come uh, to 370 J Street and and, and uh, be in that office and work there. But I said, nope, I'm, I'm, they're not going to carry me out of here on a <laughs> pine board. <laughs> now, um, at the end of the interview now, if you tell us a little bit about that, a little family history. Okay. The interesting thing about this is that this is a copy of an original which is in the family archives. The discharge papers of my great grandfather, Noah Goldsboro, who served with the U.S. Colored Troops during the Civil War and was discharged uh, in Roanoke Island, uh, Virginia or North Carolina, which is it? Roanoke Island. Uh, uh, in Virginia. Roanoke Island, mm -hmm. Virginia. At any rate, he was, he was uh, in the 10th day of December, 1865, and he received, after a $10 deduction, $190 which was the same amount that I received uh, in uh, August of 1946 when I was discharged. Mm -hmm. All right, um, now did you want to show us some uh, photographs, photographs or anything? from your album? Mm -hmm. These, of course, were pictures that were, uh, I, I bought these pictures here, the, mm -hmm. these pictures. Uh, uh, these are pictures of some of uh, my fellow troops and uh, some of the young ladies that we, as the saying goes, were friendly with, okay? Now, are you in any of those photographs? No, I'm not in any of those, uh, in any of those uh, photographs. Because I was the one taking the picture, okay. and I, that, that's what happens when I. Uh, uh, I when if, if you moving. can, if you can, like turn yeah. it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was in a, a unit of a number of uh, very nice fellows. Uh, many of them were from the West Coast, uh, California and whatnot, and so on. Um, uh, I don't recall. I'm in this picture here with this. Uh, this is the only picture I think that you'll see me in. Uh, she was a lovely young lady, friend, and so on. Okay. And, um, uh, but basically, um, the the young ladies were they they were very, as I said, very friendly. Uh, they, they liked. Um, um, we, we, we would give them various things, uh, cig uh, cigarettes, uh, candy, and what, what not, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but at any rate, the um, experience was one that uh, I don't think I'll ever forget. Um, Fujiami, I mean, Mount Fujiami, I, I drove up there several times uh, to see the um, the mountain, you know, as far as I could get, and so on. To be honest with you, I don't recall uh, many of the. Now this is these are the young boys you were telling us about. Yeah, here I am in this picture here. Yes, yeah, I'm in this picture here. Yeah, these are the young boys. These are the young boys here. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, this is our, I can't, I don't know that I can find, this is my, a picture of my uh, company, okay? I, I, I would have to look a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is that okay? Yeah, it's, it's not really mm -hmm. focusing in on it close up. No, you, it, it, it's quite small anyway. Yeah.
I don't know if there. I can't get super close up, but I, I could mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. that it was uh, mm -hmm. a unit picture. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. I hope, I hope it is of value. Yes. Yes. Um, it's my story. <laughs>